It's so good to be with you. Just want to welcome you here into the living room. I know you're allowing me to be in your life, in your home, in your living room. And I just believe that something good is going to happen today. I really believe that with all my heart. The Holy Spirit is here to help us with this word that we're about to enjoy and about to unfold. But he's there to bring you healing, to bring you help, to deliver you of all your fears and anxiety. Right now, Holy Spirit, just breathe on my friend. Just deliver them of all the fear, the loneliness, the anxiety. Holy Spirit, minister healing to their bodies physically. Right now, I call my friend healed by Jesus' stripes. And Holy Spirit, you said that you would help administrate the, the work of the cross that Jesus had already accomplished into their life. And now, Holy Spirit, stay with us. Unfold the word of God into our heart. Let the seed connect with the soil of our life and may it produce, may it increase in our hearts. May it increase and produce life, everlasting life in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Did you know that there are circuit breakers in life that the enemy likes to employ in your vicinity in your world so that he can shut down the power of God in your life. Now, look, the enemy has no defense against God's power. I mean, it's not kind of like, you know, black and white, like, you know, sometimes you've heard people talking about, you know, God wrestling with the enemy. There, there is no wrestling match. God utterly destroys the enemy anytime he wants. But God wants to get power into your life and the enemy can't stop the light. The darkness can't stop the light. But if the enemy can get you to believe a lie, you can stop the light. You can stop the power. So we're going to talk about circuit breakers today. And I think you're going to love this talk. You know what? Lonely is a byproduct of darkness. Lonely is a byproduct of powerlessness, emptiness. So let's turn to Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. And I want to show you something. Look at this. Ephesians 1. 18 and 19. I pray, this is the Apostle Paul praying for the people of God. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, did you know that your heart has eyes? I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being may be enlightened, flooded with light. Isn't that amazing? How God's word is totally revealing to us that we're supposed to be lit up from the core of our being, from the inside out. Did you hear that? God wants you lit, flooded with light, glowing, not in the dark. When you answer the big questions in life, it brings a sense of fulfillment, identity, purpose, even direction in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the lonely and the distraught. It brings the answer. You know what? Feelings are a weak compass to live by. If your feelings are steering your boat, you're headed for trouble. But I've got good news for you. If you've been feeling bounced around by the circumstances, worried and confused, or even just plain lonely and discouraged, today is your day. You're watching this not by accident. I don't believe that. This is not a coincidence. God set you up. He set me up. We're here together. This is divine appointment in Jesus' name. God plans to hook you up today. I believe that. The circumstances of today are not the problem. Stephen, can you say that again? I said, the circumstances of today are not the real problem. The problem is not being powered up. Think about this. The ocean isn't the problem until your ship is sinking. Pam and I, we were on a, a little bit of a holiday a couple of years ago, and we were taking a, um, one of those cruises up the West Coast to Alaska. And so it was really beautiful one day. We were out, the waters were calm, and we we're out on the balcony out on the side, and suddenly there was a pod of killer whales, you know, the orcas. And you know, from where we were, it was beautiful. We were like, oh my goodness, thank God, what an opportunity to see these beautiful whales coming in and out of the water. I mean, it was just gorgeous. The sun was out, the waters were calm. Now I want you to think for a second. The exact same situation, but just remove the ship. Just take the big boat away. And Pam and I are there. The ocean's calm. And there's a pod of killer whales around us. 
It's not so exciting. It's not so nice, is it? It's not so beautiful. It's not so praiseworthy. Oh, God, thank you. No, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Why? Because the circumstances, the, the problem isn't the killer whales or the ocean. The problem is not being powered up, not being on the ship, not being in the context of great power and a great fortress. And in life, so many people end up cursing the situation. They end up cursing the calm waters, the killer whales, everything around them, not because of that's the problem. They're cursing it because of their situation, because of their context, because they're not enraptured in the power that God has ordained for them. So I want to talk about God's plan for you and that he's always planned to connect you, to hook you up, to put you in the right context. Aren't you glad Aren't you glad that God wants to interrupt your trouble right now? Replacing your darkness with light. Light has no defense against the darkness. None. Look at our precious little bulb again. Can we talk about our bulb? Remember, we learned that the bulb needs to abide in. So here we go. We're going to put the, the bulb abiding in, abiding in Christ, right? But we know that's not enough. The bulb has to abide in. But at the same time, the word of God, which carries the love of God, which carries the power of God, the word of God has to be on the inside of the light. Right. Let's let me take you to John 15, verse seven. Jesus said this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if you if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, says Jesus, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Isn't that beautiful? When you are abiding in Christ and his word, his power is abiding in you. You ask whatever you want in this state of being lit up and it will be done for you. Now, the problem is we start trying to do the same thing. We back off on the abiding, the word abiding in us. And so we pray the same prayers and we're not lit and we're wondering what's going on. How come I'm not getting that same outcome? Jesus said, if you remain in me and my word remains in you. You will ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. So for the next few minutes, let me explain to you how you were designed to be connected and how connection affects your direction, and direction ultimately amps up your protection. Genesis 2, verse 18, a little review. Now the Lord God said, it's not good, sufficient, satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. The word he says there is ezer. That Hebrew word means salvation. It means um, great help. It's the same word that God uses to describe himself in Psalm 121, verse 2, where he says, I am your, the God who made heaven and earth. I will be your help. The same word, easer, I will make him a helper, suitable, adapted, complimentary for him. God saw Adam alone and he said, it's not enough. It's not sufficient. It's not satisfactory. God was saying, I got more for you. God's always thinking about more for you, not less, not constricted, but expanded. God's not just thinking addition. He's thinking multiplication. God didn't want to just give Adam a friend. He didn't want to just give Adam and Eve so that they could kind of hold hands and be friendly. He wanted to give Adam and Eve so that he could have many, 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 many children. God's always got family on his mind. He's always got expansion for you on his mind. It's not good to be alone. It's not profitable to be alone. Have you ever felt alone? I mean, really alone. That type of loneliness that Standing in the middle of a crowd, it only exasperates, it only intensifies, it just makes you feel like you just can't go on. My friend, you're not the only one. Albert Einstein, think about this, one of the smartest men who ever lived, Albert Einstein said this, it is strange to be known so universally and yet to be so lonely. Intellect, genius, cannot insulate you from not being lit. Ernest Hemingway, brilliant, talented writer. 
He said this, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there is no current to plug into. If you don't know, Ernest Hemingway, he committed suicide just from the pain of the emptiness. And think of his analogy. He's talking about as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead. Think of it. He's talking about this light. He's saying, man, to be, I feel so lonely. I'm just like this bulb with no energy. He was waiting for, longing for Jesus. He needed Jesus. We all need Jesus. Whether you're Albert Einstein or whether you're Ernest Hemingway, I want to point, let's say, talk about beauty. Marilyn Monroe was known to be one of the most beautiful actresses, models, just stunning, world famous. She said this, I think the only people who stay with me are the people I pay. And you know that she died tragically alone. David the psalmist, one of the greatest king warriors, songwriters, one of the wealthiest men who had ever lived. David the psalmist said this, insults have broken my heart. I hope for sympathy, but here was none. Psalm 69, verse 20. David the king, who knew God, felt alone, but it was in a time of his life when he had Drop that connection with God. He wasn't connected. He was missing being lit from the inside out. Doesn't matter if your name's David the Psalmist or if your name's J.K. Rowling, the famous author of Harry Potter books. She said this, that she used her own dark suicidal thoughts as the inspiration for the Dementor characters in her book. I hope you're getting the picture that you're not alone. You're not the only one. You may feel lonely, but you're not the only one. Many people. I could go on and on talking about famous, talented, gifted people and their loneliness, their isolated feelings that drive them to self-destruction. But all of that to say, you are not the only one feeling this way. We've all had that experience of being in a crowd and feeling alone. The real question is, are you accepted? Are you rejected? Are you worthy? Are you loved? These are big questions. Let me give you a truth answer to begin lighting up your heart. Hebrews 13, verse 5. God says this to you right now. He says, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Verse 6, he says, so we take comfort and are encouraged. Oh, yes. That's how you and I take comfort and encourage when we know the truth. Remember, Jesus said this in John 8. He said, you will know the truth. He never said the truth would set you free. So many people say that, and it's a lie. You have to know the truth. You have to know the truth to make that connection for the light to come on. Elijah the prophet, he felt alone and super depressed. He was a prophet of God. But was he really alone? See, his perception was God had forsaken him. He was alone. He even told God, he said, I'm the only one that believes in you anymore. And God's like, really? He says, I actually have 7,000 people back home that have not bowed a knee to me. Was Elijah really alone? See, the enemy works this lie to make you believe you're the only one. He's a divide and conquer strategist. When you're a child of God, you're God's responsibility. He promises to watch over you. Remember this, God Almighty chose you. He chose you not as an employee, not as an a servant. I mean, think of it. If God did choose me, looked at my resume and choose me as an employee, I would think, wow, I got chosen by God to work for him. I would think that's pretty good. I think I'd be pretty excited. But that's, but that's not even the beginning of it. God chose you to be his child in his family. Come on, turn with me to Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. You're going to love this. 
God chose us in Christ, actually picked us out for himself as his own before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy. That is consecrated, set apart for him and blameless in his sight before him in love. He predestined us, that is God, and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. Oh, my friend, come on. Just right where you are right now, just say this, just, just tap your, yourself and just say, God chose me. God chose me. I mean, if you can imagine like God flipping through a catalog going, oh, I, I've... I've got to have her. I've got to have him. Oh, they're wonderful. God chose you before the foundation of the world. God chose you. Oh, that's so beautiful. He didn't just make you. He didn't just create you. He chose you because God believes you are so very special, beautiful, wonderful, valuable. And nothing breaks your power circuit. Nothing breaks that connection like your ignorance of that truth. Nothing breaks your power circuit, your ignorance of that truth, like the, your ignorance of that truth. Truth like who made you, why God made you, who you belong to, how valuable you are. There was a man, Viktor Serebikov. He was the son of Russian immigrants. I think it was the early 1900s in the UK. And his teacher, when he was just a young boy, told him uh, and told his parents that he was not very intelligent. He wasn't the brightest bulb on the block, and therefore they didn't see that it was worth him educating and he should just get some vocation doing some very simple, mindless job. And so, you know, Victor jumped around from position to position. That was one of those times when parents basically just took the word of an authority to the bank and it was like, well, if that's what the authorities say, that was, must be the way it was. And Victor believed the bad news that he wasn't very worthwhile. Well, I think it was in his early 20s, he had to take a, to get a certain job, he had to take an IQ test from the military. Well, they, they have their margins and they took the test for him. But, you know, of course, Victor blew it again. He somehow didn't fit in their margins. And, you know, they had to send him to, I think it was either Oxford or Cambridge, but they sent him there to get an IQ test. Well, Victor took a test with these educated professors, the academic people of the day, and guess what they found out? They said, Victor, you're a genius. Your IQ is off the charts. Victor, you're not a dummy. You're smarter than all the rest of us. Well, suddenly, suddenly, for some reason or another, Victor started getting all these inventions, owning all these patents, coming up with great discoveries, writing books. How did that happen? Victor came to the knowledge of his worth, even just a little bit more. Suddenly his light bulb started glowing when he started realizing, wow, God didn't make junk. God made something beautiful of my life. In 2000, Blockbuster, you, you might not even remember that name, but Blockbuster ruled the home entertainment industry with their DVD rentals. When along came this little upstart called Netflix, a struggling online mail order company trying to mail you those same DVDs. Well, its CEO offered to sell Netflix to Blockbuster for 50 million bucks. Now, that sounds like a lot of money. 50 million bucks. It sounds like a lot of money, but um, Blockbuster laughed them out of the building. Fast forward to now. Netflix got into streaming. People stopped renting DVDs. Blockbuster has basically evaporated into nothing. And today, Netflix is valued at over 190 billion, with a B, 190 billion dollars. Isn't that amazing? That's about, that's about, well, close to 4,000 times the evaluation that Netflix was willing to sell themselves to Blockbuster for back in the early 2000s. Wow. Someone was ignorant of value. Humanity has a track record of not recognizing true value. But God, he sees you. 
He sees you. And even when others bypass you and kind of maybe laugh you out of the building, God sees you. He sees your value. And God says this, I choose you. I'm choosing you. Isn't that beautiful? My friends, lonely is not good. But lonely is not being alone. Lonely comes from not being lit. Right? This glass, let's just take a look at this glass. This glass is basically just liquid sand. You know, the Lord formed our bodies from the dust of the ground. But this glass, the glass part is not you. It's just a body. Your height, your weight, your money, your skin color, your sexuality, your age, your education, your intellect, your job. It's all just liquid sand. It's just glass. You were made in God's image. And remember this, God is light. And no other identity but light will light you up and fulfill your design. Therefore, we could stand you in a crowd of a million light bulbs and flood you with affirmation from the outside in, and it still will not chase away the lonely. And don't buy the lie that you're the only one or that there's something wrong with you. Don't buy that. Did you know that other great leaders have fought overwhelming feelings of depression and loneliness? Many world leaders have struggled with clinical depression and loneliness. How does God answer lonely? Even at the leadership level? Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble and dread before them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. He hooks you up. God hooks you up. I said this earlier, but the loneliness is a war strategy by the enemy. He's into divide and conquer. He needs you feeling isolated and feeling alone. He wants you to feel like you truly are spiritually isolated, segregated, alone, and without value, without importance. That's how he breaks your circuit. He's a circuit breaker. The enemy is a circuit breaker. He wants to break the connection. See, he has no defense against God's power, but he needs you to, to throw the switch some way and break the circuit. Listen to this. In 1 Peter 5, 8, this is, what the, this is what it says here, that the devil is seeking whom he may devour. You know who that is? Disconnected people. The enemy can only devour disconnected people. The devil has no defense against the light. All he can do is operate in the darkness. He can't handle God's power. He can't come close to it. He needs you in the off position, but he needs you to do that. Just like he seduced our grandmother Eve in the garden to flip her switch off, he needs you and me to flip our switches off. 1 Peter 5 talks about our need for humility and being free from care and alert and hooked up by faith. So, let me give you this. There are circuit breakers in life that shut the power off and make you vulnerable to the dark. Can I say that again? There are circuit breakers in life that the enemy uses. He's a strategist to shut the power off and make you vulnerable to the dark. The first one that comes to my mind, ignorance. You know, ignorance, it can seem so small. It can seem like it's not a big deal. It's like, What's this in my life? This is nothing. But not knowing the truth is not an excuse. Hosea 4, 6 says this. God says, my people perish because of what they don't know. Your light's out. Look at, look at what happens here. It just seems so small, but it's a little bit of ignorance. And you and I, we know when the ignorance is gone, that thing lights up. But as soon as we put a little bit of ignorance there, watch what happens. Nothing. And it's like you're going through the same motions. And it's like you, you think you're, you're going to church, but you refuse to know your worth. You refuse to know what God says about you. And the ignorance takes over your life, turns your light off. It's so sad. It's so lonely. How about this one? Pride. Oh, my goodness. It seems so small, like it's just a little bit of pride. I mean, like, come on, what's that can't be that big of a deal, right? Just a little bit of pride. Pride insulates you from power. Second Chronicles 7, 14 is a famous verse that talks about, it says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves 
and pray. Well, you know what a lot of times I find is people get religious. They think that somehow if they pray enough that they can just skip the first part. If my people, which are called by my name, my identity, will humble themselves. And so then they got this. Look, they're praying. Oh, we're, you know, we're, we're abiding in Jesus and we're praying. Come on. Maybe we just need to pray more to get results. We're going to light up. I think, you know, if we just pray, maybe we should add fasting to it. Come on. Come on. Nothing's happening. So then you know what we do? We take the nothing happening and we go, well, I guess therefore it must be God's will that he's not lighting up. I mean, it must be just God's will. God's testing him, giving him a time of darkness. Come on. You and I know that's foolish. Humble yourself. Take, get the pride out of your life. That's all it is. You know, here's another big one to insulate, to, to break your circuit. Offense. Offense insulates you from the truth. Psalm 119 verse 165 says this, those who love God's law, nothing offends them. You know, one of the things I've noticed in the church is that offenses, they can come in. Well, you know, my sister, she did that to me and she still hasn't apologized. So we go through the motions, we go through the motions, but still no light. Oh, well, I guess the Lord's just taking me through a wilderness. Hey, Jesus was lit even in the wilderness. No offense. You got to get rid of the offense. You know, the other big one is sowing discord among the brethren. God says in Proverbs 6, I think it's verse 19. He says, I hate sowing seeds of discord among the brethren. Why? Why would God hate that? Well, look, because you're designed to be lit and discord among the brethren. It just shuts you down. No light. God wants you lit. Here's another big one. False belief. Believing lies. When you believe a lie about yourself or about God, you know, that God somehow, you have to prove that, you know, you're worth loving. When you believe that lie, look. When you believe that you're not worth loving, it shuts off your light. You have to believe God's truth. You got to believe God's truth. Wrong relationships. This is a big one. Man, wrong associations. Nothing brings on lonely like circuit breaking relationships. Parents, think about your children for a second. You want the best for them, right? Well, God wants the best for you. You're his child. Please don't blame power failure on God. God is faithful. The love is always flowing. The love is always flowing, but the enemy needs you to have a wrong relationship in your life. One wrong relationship. You know, if the enemy wants to destroy your life, all he'd ask to do is bring one wrong relationship into your life. Remember the children of Israel? They were supposed to go into the promised land and they had a few wrong relationships with some people and suddenly it shut down the power of their, of their life and kept them locked in the wilderness. They couldn't believe. This is what God said. He said, I could not let them into the promised land because of their evil heart of unbelief. They believed the wrong people. Believing the wrong people is dangerous. You've got to accept responsibility for your dark, lost, and lonely and you can quickly clear the break. You know, it's just like it's a matter of just Jesus. I repent. Let me get my pride on here. Jesus, I repent of this pride. I bring it to the cross and I lay it down. Jesus, I repent of that wrong relationship. I've been blaming them. It's my fault. I lay it down at the cross. You just take it like that. Jesus, I've been sowing discord among the brethren. I've been saying wrong things and I've been going around stirring things up. Jesus, I repent of that. Please forgive me. I lay it down at the cross. And guess what happens? Beautiful. You're lit up. You're lit up the way God wants you. And now you don't have to pray for 14 hours to get one little eye answer. Now you just get hooked up. You get all that stuff out of the way and you can pray prayers like Jesus. Jesus just said, hey, this be done. This be done. God delights in answering your prayers. Remember what we said in the beginning. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Not you will do it. It will be done for you. God delights in answering prayer. Isn't that good news? 
Ephesians 1, verses 18, 19 says this. I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches and his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people, and so that you will begin to know what the immeasurable and unlimited surpassing greatness of his power is to us who believe. My friends, stop the short circuit and make the loneliness work for you. How's that? Look, let the emptiness, the loneliness trigger you to go back to Jesus. Don't waste a good old fashioned, sad and lonely and desperate feeling. Use them as fuel today to push you toward Jesus. Your story right now is being written. The Lord is writing your amazing testimony and you're going to be an amazing blessing to so many others. That's right. You have something so valuable to give to others. But never forget this. When you really live you're giving. Light gives. Lonely contracts and disintegrates and dissolves. So don't run from loneliness. Use it as a trigger to run to Jesus and be like Jesus. He loves you, suffered for you. You can trust a Savior who willingly died for you even when you didn't know Him. Let loneliness trigger you to reconnect with God the Father. In His presence is joy. Isn't that what Psalm 1611 says? Let loneliness trigger you into the action of giving. God so loved that he gave. And since you know you are forever connected to Father God's family, imitate him. Act like him. Give yourself permission to imitate your Abba Father. Look at Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father and walk in love, esteeming and delighting in one another as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a slain offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet fragrance. You even make the room smell good. When you start imitating God, isn't that beautiful? You have permission to imitate your Abba Father. This culture is always on the take. Me, my, I, it's all about what I get or take. But that's not truly living. People who live immoral or promiscuous are some of the most lonely, confused, and disconnected people on planet Earth. Physical connection without spiritual and emotional connection, sanctioned by God, approved by your maker, that's death. God's wisdom on how to bypass the short circuits and apply connection. Let me give this to you. Give me four in the next few minutes, just four, God's wisdom on how to bypass those short circuits and apply connection over these next few days. Your whole life can change. Number one, you've got to set your mind. Don't wait for God to do it. You do it. Your mind is a gift from God and it will work for you or against you, but you've got to set it just like your thermostat. Pam and I, we set our thermostat at around 70 degrees. We like that. And you know what? You've got to set it so that you can enjoy the, the outcome, the predictable outcome. Set your mind and keep it set on things that are above. That's what Colossians 3.2 says. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, of a good report, if there's any excellence or praiseworthy, think on these things. But you do that. So number one, set your mind. Number two, eliminate the unnecessary. There are connections that you have right now that are making you feel more disconnected, more alone, more sad, more mad. People pray about these bad connections for a lifetime and end up going to their grave sad. Don't do this. The Bible says Lot. Remember Lot? He was the nephew of Abraham, a righteous man. And it says Lot living among them. That was in Sodom and Gomorrah, living among those people tortured his righteous soul every day with what he saw and what he heard. That's 2 Peter 2, 8. You don't have to do that. Learn from Lot's mistake and you need to eliminate the unnecessary. Eliminate the activity and the busyness, the criticism, the complaining, the unhealthy relationships and go back to number one and set your mind on things above. Number three, cry upward. 
Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. If anybody needs to hear your cry, it's God Almighty. And in verse 2, it says, He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Look at how it's gone from crying to now singing. Right? Praise to our God. Many will trust in the Lord. Hey, if a guy who's considered one of the top king warriors on planet Earth cries, we know that real men cry. You just got to face the right direction. You got to cry up. Don't cry. Look, horizontally, what can people do for you in place of God? God's the one who can hear your cry and do something about it and turn it into a song. And number four, give. You got to give. Those who live, give. Number one, you've got to set your mind. Number two, eliminate the unnecessary. Three, cry upward. And number four, give. If you really want to overcome loneliness and be connected, learn the art of giving. Living is giving. Light gives. Love gives. Period. It's darknesses that it's darkness that teaches this vacuum style of existence. Give me, give me. It's all about me. Jesus gives us his life, right? But it's in exchange for our life. We give him our brokenness. We give to him our life. Then we imitate God and shine our light. What's that mean? To give, to help others. What's it look like? Forgive your sister. Forgive your brother. Maybe you got divorced 10 years ago. Look, it's time to forgive your ex. You can't keep dragging that along. It's short-circuiting your light. Help your mom. Help your dad. Give your neighbor a smile. Send a cheerful text. Phone someone in a nursing home and cheer them up. Give someone a job. Give your boss your best. Give your attention, give your focus, give of your resources, give your best. With God's guidance, give strategically, not randomly, but in obedience to his power. Today, let you and I resolve your short circuit problems. We can change this all right now. Are you willing? Do you want to? There's a world of difference between self-isolating and spiritually isolating. Physical isolation is just having your liquid sand, your glass, separated. It's physical. But spiritual isolation, it's about the absence of power. No light, darkness, disconnected, deep trouble. You're designed to be part of the body of Christ, part of the family of God. And if you're spiritually isolated, you're disconnected from God's plan, His will, His family, even God can't protect you when you're spiritually isolated. You're outside of His plan, outside of His will. 1 Peter 5 verses 6 and 7 tells us this, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that God may lift us up. What's that mean? Exalt us, lift us up. It means light you up. To humble is to strip off. That's what we did over here. Remember, we stripped off the pride. We stripped off the arrogance, the ignorance. We took it off and allowed God's power to flow. Get the circuit breakers out of your life. If you find yourself going dark and contracting, don't let fear counsel you right now. Let love guide you. God wants to give you his life power, but you've got to give him all of your emptiness. Love gives, love reaches out. God has given us a family light, the family DNA in Jesus' blood, the family name, the family code of conduct. We have the family will and testament now in effect. My goodness, this is so good. So let's get rid of the circuit breakers, get connected with Jesus. Jesus said this in John 14, 6, he said, I'm the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. No woman comes to the Father except by and through me. Do you want to deal with that lonely right now? That sad and that darkness, that disconnected? All you have to do is put your faith in Jesus right now. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Say this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to live in the light always with you in my heart. You died on the cross for me. God raised you up from the grave. I receive your forgiveness. I receive God's love. I'm not alone. I'm in the family of God. 
born again with a new identity in your name, Jesus. Amen.